What's up everybody? Today I'm going to be breaking down my recent trip to the Pacific Northwest. Amazing location, one of the most epic regions I've ever been to. There's just an innumerable number of locations to photograph there and to visit. If you're into the outdoors, if you're into hiking, if you're into waterfalls and beaches and coastlines, it's definitely the place to visit. I'm going to be covering logistics, how to get there, how to get around. Uh, places to stay, whether it makes more sense to stay at the campgrounds, Airbnbs or hostels and where they're located and then general location advice as it pertains to photography, what time to arrive, where to shoot and uh, how to get to all these places. My lo original location guide had about 60 plus locations on it and on this trip, 10 days, 9, 10 days, I was only able to visit about 20 of those and that was driving 3,000 3, miles around the whole area, coastlines, inland, the whole the whole area it's just there's so much to see you got to spend more than a month there just camper vanning it out and visiting all these amazing locations so let's dive right in i will mention that i made my trip during the current as of uh, august june july august uh, the current covid lockdown sort of situation things are starting to open back up and so there were a lot of uh, campgrounds and places to see that were open but some of the ones that i almost some of the ones that I want to see the most like Multnomah Falls and some other ones like that they were actually closed down because I guess they were avoiding large crowds and uh, it did affect somewhat of my travel plans and it will affect some of the advice as far as what makes sense and where to visit after each location but uh, just uh, something that I should put out there. Your point of entry will vary based on whether you're flying in, whether you're driving in, whether you want to visit more of the locations up north in uh, Washington or visit more of the Oregon locations. There are an equal amount of locations in both states so there's definitely a lot to see. I personally flew into Seattle. We visited a couple locations at the Olympics National Park then drove down the coastline, worked our way down to pretty much the border of California and Oregon, visited a bunch of locations on the way there, then did the same routes going back north up to Seattle because I was flying out of Seattle, visiting all the inland locations or as many as I could on that trip. So it really depends. You can fly into Portland or you can fly into Seattle and there's a bunch of smaller airports in between that uh, might make more sense logistically. Driving is relatively easy around the area. There's a few sort of off-road kind of things when you get to maybe uh, Mount Rainier National Park. We encountered some really bumpy, unpaved roads, but for the most part, you can get around anywhere with a regular car. I would recommend maybe getting a camper van or something that will make the logistics as far as lodging and where you're going to stay a little bit easier. I visited under COVID locations, so some of the campgrounds were closed down, some were recently opening back up. It was, I was a little bit more limited in places to stay, but in general, there are plenty of options. We did a mix of camping and uh, staying at a couple Airbnbs every few days just to have a regular bed to sleep in and, and rest up in between all these long drives. As you get down to the southern coast, the, the cities become smaller and smaller and there's not really Airbnbs and, and regular lodging available. So uh, that's where campgrounds would make most sense. The uh, Pacific Northwest in general, to me, seem to be a very outdoorsy kind of crowd. Every, everywhere you're driving, there's just people in RVs, there are large RV parks everywhere. So, and the RV parks have uh, tent sites, uh, campsites for, for tenting as well. So um, just keep that in mind that these, these places can get really busy under uh, regular non-COVID circumstances. Regarding when to visit, I'd say it's a more temperate climate from what I hear. I didn't visit in the winter, but from what I hear, there is light snowfall, if any. Um, it's generally a warmer type of area, so you can you can visit in the fall, you can visit in, in the winter. Um, in some of the areas, actually, there is snow year-round. When we visited, um, we drove up to Mount Rainier National Park. This was in, in, in June, July. There was, uh, there was actually still snow around, and, and a couple of the lakes were frozen or semi-frozen, which is very surprising for it considering, you know, it's summer. But uh, apparently that's how it is most of the year. It thaws out maybe a few weeks out of the year in some of these areas. Crater Lake, there was also some snow up there when I, when I made the trip there. And um, it gets quite wintry in the winter there, which makes for a interesting, interesting different kind of landscapes. So plan your trip accordingly. Summer is obviously going to be the most busy time of the year. So whatever makes sense for your schedule, the areas seem to be pretty accessible year-round. Now let's go ahead and get into the locations. I'm going to just follow somewhat the route that I did um, on my road trip. We started from Seattle, drove down and up into the peninsula, down the coastline to Oregon, and then 
visited the inland locations and worked our way back up to Seattle. So I'll just lay the guide out in that order just to make it easier. I'll begin with Olympic National Park since it was the first location we drove into. There are different points of the park where they will charge you the uh, park entrance fee at the beginning of Ho Forest, Ho, Ho National Forest. There was a, a little gated entry there where they um, they charge the fee and then different areas of the, of the park um, there's a park ranger station where they'll, they'll charge you. I believe the park entrance fee was about 15 bucks, 15 or 20, depending how many people you have in the car. And uh, if you're going by car, or walking or by bike or something. And they apply it to all locations, so you just need to keep the, uh, the receipt they give you um, or your email with the confirmation. A lot of the coastlines seem to be pretty open, so you can just kind of like show up there, take photos and do whatever you want. So. Um, our first location was Ruby Beach, which is sort of like on the middle, uh, on the coast of the peninsula. Uh, really, really amazing looking uh, beach. It's sort of that signature Pacific Northwest style. You have your sea stacks, you have your rock formations, plenty of driftwood in the area, some small tide pools and sort of ponds, and uh, a lot of different uh, things to work with as far as your compositions. A lot of these locations on the coast are primarily sunset uh, shoot locations just given that the sun is gonna be setting on that side. We did stay uh, for astrophotography and for sunrise the next morning, but um, it really depends if you have clouds in the sky, you know, if you have the sun lighting from the opposite side of the horizon and you have clouds over there and, and sunrise might work out. Astrophotography was pretty decent. There's not a lot of light pollution there, though you're not really supposed to camp out there. Uh, there's a sign and uh, we sort of, uh, rogue camped set up our sleeping bags over there on the beach behind some driftwood pnw trip day two we have become hipsters so i would just keep that in mind it's good for sunset astro sun a little bit of sunrise like i said um, it's also a no drone area but overall ruby beach is definitely a, a must see not the most epic of beaches and and, and rugged uh, rock formation coastlines but it's definitely a must visit when you are in the olympic national park area the next location I visited was the Ho Rainforest. It's quite interesting that it's an actual rainforest because you think of rainforests, you think of usually the Amazon or tropical rainforests in Central America or something, but because of its uh, humidity and just the climate there, it's considered a rainforest. I wouldn't say it was that humid, but there is um, mosquitoes and that kind of stuff. It's located pretty much in the middle of the peninsula, about four hours from Seattle, a little bit less from Tacoma because there isn't a direct road. You have to sort of go around the top or around the bottom. Key locations here are the Hall of Mosses, which um, I heard a lot about. It's a whole trail, it's about one mile, uh, pretty easy to do. Uh, there's no elevation gain or anything. But um, finding shots is kind of tricky. There's ferns, there's the signature mosses hanging from the trees, there's this one open area, kind of where I um, got one of my key shots. But uh, it's surprisingly tricky. I think it might be better if you um, sort of plan your visit, I don't know how, but when it's a little bit foggy and you have those uh, sunbeams coming through and that's kind of key with forest photography, having some sun rays or sunbeams, which can always be added in post with some of these programs, but I consider that cheating. But um, Hall of Mosses is one of the more popular hikes. It was also the uh, Maples Trail. I don't know if it was Hall of Maples, but um, another trail nearby, a lot shorter. And there's a few trails in the area. We didn't spend too much time there. I got a couple shots that I had in mind when I visited, but a um, good place to visit even when it's overcast, though you won't have the sun rays. If you're having weather that doesn't really make for good shots over on the coastline when you need these epic skies you can hit some of the forests and this applies to a lot of locations that you visit like the redwood forest down south but uh, overall a nice little stop you don't really have to spend more than a couple hours here but the whole rainforest is definitely uh, a location that you can quickly stop by do a quick hike get some uh, get some pretty cool shots and then keep keep moving another location we visited in washington was the mount rainer national park it's quite a large area and there's numerous roads coming to uh, different parts of the area facing different viewpoints of the mountain as you can imagine. We did one attempt to visit uh, a large waterfall that's sort of nearby called Spray Falls but at a certain point the road was blocked off. I assume it was due to COVID but uh, there wasn't a sign that clearly said why it was blocked off. We just made most of the drive there on these off-road conditions and then just couldn't couldn't go further. Of course, you could do the hike, but I believe it was about three miles uh, left of the road and didn't really feel like making that effort. We did drive back a little bit and there was a nice little viewpoint of Mount Rainier and the peak. 
and uh, some clouds over there. So I shot a time lapse there, and then we actually drove all the way around to visit another key location in the Mount Rainier National Park known as Lake Tipso. Lake Tipso is probably what I would recommend if you're visiting and you're limited in the not a number of locations you can visit in that area. But Lake Tipso definitely was a, a nice classic shot. There's actually two lakes. When we visited, Lake Tipso was actually mostly frozen and there was snow everywhere and there wasn't really an angle of the mountain. And then through just kind of wandering around, I stumbled across a smaller lake next to it called Little Lake Tipso. And this is the actual shot that I had seen when I was doing my research for my locations. And it has the view of uh, Mount Rainier in the background, a little opening with the trees and then the lake um, in front of you. Uh, something to keep in mind is that uh, it's quite popular with photographers, even though it's unmarked. But uh, when I showed up, there was one person there and then quickly filled up maybe about 10, 10, 15 people very easily showed up there for sunset. We are on location at Little Tipso. Needless to say, I think I found the right location to shoot. <laughs> the photographer spot. Friends. Judging by how many people. Mount Rainier is about one and a half hours from Tacoma, a little bit more from Seattle. And as I mentioned, it's snowy uh, almost year round. We showed up there in the summer and there was snow everywhere. And um, it was a little bit of a cold night. Uh, slept in the car because I um, kind of wanted to shoot Astro at the uh, Lake Tipso there. So um, Lake Tipso, definitely a good sunset location from what I hear. It doesn't make for the best sunrise shoots because of the angle of the sun. That also will depend on the time of year. But one of the locals did recommend a nearby trail or actually is further down the road. It was called uh, Sunrise, I believe. And that's ironically where it's best to shoot sunrise. As far as ast Astro, it might also depend on the time of year. I was able to shoot the Milky Way and had the reflection there at Little Lake Tipso. But I had wanted the Milky Way actually by the, the peak of Mount Rainier. And it was just not the uh, right time of year for that. It was just too much to the side so just kind of had to shoot what I had there but overall nice place to visit you know not a long drive from the from the big city and uh, very picturesque uh, kind of mountainous terrain uh, for landscape photography. As you work your way southwards you'll encounter and you probably have heard of Columbia River Gorge it's a very large expansive uh, what's considered a scenic state scenic area and it actually is on the border of Washington and Oregon. So there's locations that are on one side of the border or the other, though it's pretty easy to just cross between. There's uh, plenty of bridges and stuff. It's a paradise for waterfall photography and, and forest kind of stuff. There's just, again, an innumerable number of waterfalls. I literally only had time to visit two of them and um, partially because of time and partially because of some of the more famous ones like Multnomah. You probably have seen that classic shot with the bridge and the large waterfall behind it. It, it was closed off due to COVID, but uh, it's definitely an area you can spend a lot of time. I'm gonna cover a couple locations, like I said, but uh, Columbia, Columbia River Gorge was just, uh, just a paradise for, for long exposure landscape photography for sure. One of the waterfalls I was most excited to see was Panther Creek Falls. Uh, it's a little bit more north of the gorge, about an hour from Portland, and a relatively short trail. You know, there's a parking lot, you walk a little bit back down the road, and then there's an upper viewpoint and a lower viewpoint. The upper viewpoint, you really don't see much. You know, I guess it's for people who really can't make the hike. It's not even that steep, to be honest, but uh, you loop back around, there's a switchback, and then you can make it down to the base of the waterfall. Seems like it flows uh, heavier or lighter at different times of the year because I've seen some photos with uh, the large water portion here and then some water coming out the side. But when I visited, it was really just the water here. And without that side water, it doesn't really give that expansive waterfall look that I was uh, hoping for. So I just kind of got a vertical shot close up. There's some logs in the foreground. There's some uh, there's a smaller waterfall that goes down so you can you can work some angles there relatively busy um, It's because it's so accessible, but uh, When I was there, there's maybe four or five people not not too many um, Something that you could visit either early morning or during the day not a lot of open sky So the lighting won't change too much whether you visit on an overcast day or later in the day earlier in the day but uh, definitely a cool waterfall to visit when you're in the Columbia River Gorge area. As I was pondering my options because some of the key waterfalls that I wanted to visit weren't accessible at Columbia River Gorge, a photographer over at Mount Rainier had actually mentioned Spirit Falls to me. It was on my list, but I wasn't really intrigued just by its description. But I will say that uh, it was just an amazing waterfall. Not so much for the size, you know, it's more of a medium-sized waterfall, but I had a couple of tiers. 
and the way the water flowed and, and just the, the beauty of the area and, and the experience of hiking, you know, you're hiking down this steep uh, hill and then all of a sudden opens up and you see this uh, spectacular waterfall and rainforest and all the greenery. And um, it was definitely one that I enjoyed a lot. It's a little tricky to reach and to find at least where the trail begins. It's about 100 yards back from the mile marker too. You'll see a pullout on the side of the road that just apparently there for no reason. But as you walk to the edge, you'll see a trail that begins down this, uh, this ridge goes into the forest, quite steep. So um, it is recommended not really for children or older people who are not comfortable in those really steep environments. Nothing too crazy, you're not climbing up or down, but it's just really steep and you're making your way down there and it's about a half hour hike. You get down to the base of the waterfall, perfect for long exposure photography. There are a couple areas at the top if you wanna focus on the main falls or if you wanna get sort of a leading line you can take a shot over here by this uh, tree or climb down if you're more adventurous and work your way down to closer to the water. And that way it's also a good setup for a selfie if you climb up on the rock and um, you have the waterfall there with the leading line and just a really awesome waterfall to visit. A location that I didn't really know too much about but I had seen popping up on social media and Instagram quite a bit was the uh, Columbia Hills State Park. It's, uh, it's a it's a park over there by the river. It's kind of a ranch and doesn't seem like there's much going on, but it's really known for this classic shot. There's um, these open meadows and fields, which during the spring, there's obviously greenery and flowers and stuff. I guess I visited too much into the summer and uh, everything was dried up. There's an abandoned antique car and you can uh, get some cool shots with the Milky Way, sunset or sunrise, depending on the angle. Once you arrive at the location from the main road, you make your way up to Dallas Mountain Ranch and you sort of have to get on Google Maps. The, uh, the car itself is actually a location on Google Maps and just find at what point do you pull off the road and then just kind of walk through the field. There seem to be sort of abandoned uh, farm uh, ranch type things. I, I went there at the middle of the night uh, to shoot astrophotography, so I'm not really sure if it's open during the day, but there was nothing really uh, fenced off or, or closed. So you just kind of make your way there, follow the fence, look at your Google Maps, and with your headlamp, you'll, uh, you'll quickly spot the car. And um, I went there in end of June, beginning of July, and the Milky Way was lined up probably not at the most optimum spot. Plus there's a little light pollution, but uh, made for a decent shot for sure. Had a light paint to the car in the foreground. Cool little bonus spot that you might've seen on Instagram um, and pretty easy to get to. Crossing the border into Oregon, one of the first locations I visited there was uh, Cannon Beach and specifically Haystack Rock. You'll recognize Haystack Rock from the movie The Goonies, um, the ending scene where they're, um, they make it out of the cave. You'll see it's a very iconic, large, 200-foot tall rock just off the shore there. It's uh, about two hours from Portland. There's a small town. It's a, uh, it's a protected area because of the birds and the wildlife, so you can't fly drones there, as tempting as it may be. Apparently there's puffins there. Uh, I didn't see any. It might be like a springtime kind of thing. Shooting actual photos there, I'd say it's a sunset for sure because it's on the coast. When I was there, we didn't really have, it was an overcast day, so there wasn't any really color, good colors or anything. So I shot kind of a long expo minimalist kind of thing. Finding a foreground might be tricky. You might have to look for textures in the sand or just receding or, or long exposure to the water might work in some ways. It can be quite busy because it's a, a popular kind of beach and people are just walking up and down so you might have to get into the water a little bit. But uh, there's a few shots to be had there. I believe you can shoot Astro there though. It's really close to the town and there's houses right there on the beach so there might be some light pollution which might be to your benefit as they light paint the haystack rock itself. I'd seen some photos, I don't know if they're composites or not. And sunrise might also work if you have uh, interesting clouds and they're being backlit by the sun but I would more likely go there for the sunset and get uh, classic haystack uh, long exposure sunset shot. Moving a little further down the coast, there is a location called the Devil's Punch Bowl. I visited during these same two days that I visited Haystack Rock and it just happened to be the two days of the trip where we had pretty much foggy overcast weather. I know that's sort of signature of that area, it tends to be that moody Pacific Northwest foggy look, though I have seen some awesome sunset shots there. But the Devil's Punch Bowl is basically, as the, the name suggests, a bowl that has been worn out and eroded from the rock and there's uh, sort of rocks inside and there's a few little caves at different angles and most people just kind of hang out at the top, take whatever photos and there's um, viewing platform right there from the parking lot. But there's a certain part of the fence that seems like people have been climbing over and you just make your way 
over the fence and then you can kind of slide down the edge of the uh, the sandy kind of cliff and then make your way through one of these caves. From my experience and what I hear, you should definitely only go during low tide because it will fill up during high tide or as the tide is going up. So there's apps for checking the tide and definitely check that in advance. You don't want to make your way into the punch bowl and then kind of get stuck there as the tide goes up or even worse, get washed out to sea. But during low tide, you can make your way in there, get some cool shots. I, I got um, a couple interesting shots with the rocks and the waves splashing and then sort of an epic selfie looking up into the sky, just making use of the location. And as I mentioned, it was easy to get into, but we couldn't climb out the same way that we made it in because these cliffs are, it's kind of sandstone, so they break away as you're climbing them. And the only way we made it out was uh, throwing the backpacks over our head and, and wading through sort of a waist, knee deep water around to the beach area. And then you can walk back up to the parking lot from there. So not the most easy location to shoot, but a cool little spot to visit if you are on the Oregon coast. Making your way further down, about two hours from the biggest city, Eugene, there is a quite famous location called Thor's Well. Thor's Well is a similar uh, coastal uh, anomaly uh, to the Devil's Punch Bowl, except it's smaller and the water actually fills from the bottom and, and explodes uh, upwards in a geyser sort of way. And that's a location where, as when you visit the Devil's Punch Bowl, you want to go during low tide. When you visit Thor's Well, you want to go during high tide because that's when the most water splashes out of the uh, Thor's Well opening. It's uh, relatively easy to find. It's right off the road. There's a parking lot couple of switchbacks, the trail makes it down to the uh, little rocky area. It's not an official trail, but plenty of people are just kind of scrambling all around the rocks. You should always keep in mind at the size of the waves and the size of the, size of the splashes because you don't want to get sucked off into the water. But uh, you can get pretty close to the Thor's well and, and just kind of study it for a few minutes and see how the waves are breaking. And that way you can decide how close you can get to the Thor's well itself for the shots. I've seen some really cool sunset shots there with nice colors, but when I visited, uh, as I mentioned, it was during this foggy, moody sort of kind of day. And, and I got kind of a cool shot with the, uh, with the fog, the coastal fog, and a sort of barely visible mountain in the distance. Gave this sort of moody, uh, eerie kind of look to the photo, long expo. You can shoot the water as it's coming out of the uh, Thor's Well. But I think what looks best is if you shoot the water receding after a big crash, and then you shoot a maybe two, three long, three second expo, of the, tra the, the water trails going back in, you'll have more interesting shot from that. I would just shoot a bunch and experiment with uh, different size of Thor's well and different angles and different shutter speeds, uh, ND filter, no ND filter, and just kind of see what you can get from that. A very uh, iconic and popular location in more inland uh, Oregon is Crater Lake. Crater Lake is about two and a half hours from the biggest nearest city of Eugene. It's a forest, it's the crater itself, which is basically like a large lake. There's an island. I heard they also do boat tours. When I visited during this COVID lockdown, most of the roads around the rim of the crater were uh, closed off because otherwise you could plan your sunrise, sunset, or astro shoot just by driving to whatever location is directly across from what you will be shooting and planting yourself there and there's there's hiking trails. But when I visited, there was pretty much just one road going in, one road going out, and I had to hike my way up to the rim. Uh, it's a higher altitude, so even hiking and plus in addition to all the gear, it's uh, the air is thinner, it's a lot more difficult. So I hiked as, as far as I could to get a, a good vantage point for the Milky Way and uh, I got one of my most favorite time lapses from that, uh, from that trip at Crater Lake. But um, shot an amazing astrophotography over there. Uh, sunset was just okay because there were really no clouds. There were some clouds on the horizon, but there was nothing up in the sky. But I got some shots of the island. It's called Wizard Island. And then some of the sun hitting the rim. Sort of composited that together and, and, um, and put together a pano. It's uh, difficult to shoot. Sort of reminded me of uh, Hiverfjall in Iceland where you can't really shoot the entire crater unless you have a drone. The difference is that you can actually fly, fly drones at Hiverfjall in, in Iceland and you can't fly drones at Crater Lake. So the best technique is really just to take a uh, vertical shot of whatever portion that you can find, a leading line, something in the foreground, and just kind of work the compositions like that. I tried the pano, not really my most favorite shot. Maybe if there were clouds in the sky, it would have looked more interesting, but uh, just tried that anyways. Uh, the trail walks along the rim, so you have to sort of be careful because there's no barrier. 
and uh, can be kind of slippery. Also to keep in mind was the incredibly crazy amount of mosquitoes, which from the parking lot, you don't really notice at all. But as soon as you get to the sort of forested area, they really come out in mass and they're just like all over you. So definitely carry some bug spray when you're at Crater Lake. While I was in the area visiting Crater Lake, I also checked out a waterfall called Toketi Falls. It's a very uh, Icelandic looking waterfall in my opinion because it's a basalt lined cliff with the waterfall cascading over. It's about 50 minutes from Crater Lake and a uh, short little hike, 0.8 mile hike to get to the viewing platform to see the, the waterfall from, from the top. Not really the best angle for photography. If you really want to get a cool shot, I would recommend uh, climbing down. It's quite steep especially if you're doing it with gear, but there's a steep little trail and there's actually a rope tied there to help you. But uh, if you carefully make your way down, it's fairly easy. You can get down to the shore and you can actually go swimming in the water if you want to. There, uh, drones are allowed in this location, so I got some interesting little drone shots. Um, there's sort of two levels to the waterfall, one more inside and then the main one on the outside. But uh, I got a cool uh, long expo photo, cool long expo uh, hyperlapse as well and um, I would say it leans more to a sunset or if it's an overcast day kind of shoot um, sun I believe the sun rises believe on the other side so it won't really work out for sunrise I went there probably too early for sunset and I had a really harsh shadow right on the waterfall line which I sort of made it work into my composition but uh, cool little spot to visit um, and it's really close to Crater Lake hands down the location that I was most excited to visit and where I probably got my best shots from was uh, Samuel H. Boardman Scenic Corridor. This is literally at the border of uh, California and Oregon. It's about 20 minutes from the border and it's a it's a whole area of which there are a few locations which I'll go into but um, the coastlines of Oregon are just something that I've never seen anywhere else and, and just the mix of the little islands and they have this little trees and many forests in addition to all that it's uh drones are allowed so it's very drone friendly you can get some awesome shots just revealing shots flying down the coast top down it's a lot you can do there you have to be careful with the birds because there was there was like some crazy seagulls that anytime i got close to the cliff they were chasing my drone and you don't want to lose your drone but just a really amazing location to visit i'm going to go ahead and start with uh, one of my favorites which was natural bridges natural bridges You'll find it on, on the map. It's uh, clearly marked. The problem is that there's a, a few different trails and it's very easy to get lost. We visited twice at a couple different times a day and, and only found it towards the end. So once you make it to the parking lot, if you walk to the left, you'll see a viewing platform where you can see the natural bridge below you. And that's kind of the classic shot. The problem is that if you're traveling alone, you can't really set your camera up and then walk all, and hike all the way down because it's a steep hike, not that long, maybe about 20 minutes, 25 minutes make it down to the bridge, you know, set your camera on a timer and come back up. What you can do is, is do that same thing with a drone or if you have a couple people, you can have somebody up there and then switch off. But uh, as mentioned, the left will bring you to that viewing platform. If you want to actually make it down to the bridge itself, you're going to take a right from the parking lot and you have to sort of keep in mind which direction you're going because the first time I visited, we just headed off to the right and follow the trail that was most obvious and that just took us to a completely different area equally photogenic but not the natural bridges area we ended up staying there for sunset and visiting natural bridges the next day so you actually you take that trail and then at some point you're kind of following you make a left and you'll sort of see it through the through the forest and through the trees and kind of figure out how to get there i'd give yourself plenty of time to sort of figure out the trails if you're there at night definitely scout during the day um, because it's not really the place you want to get lost, but overall fairly easy to make it down to uh, a little bit steep But once you make it down to the natural bridge area, there's, um, there's a few open areas where you can set up There's uh, the part on the actual rocks itself where you can take your selfies or whatever of, uh, of Yourself standing on the natural bridge. You can actually continue on the bridge There's a little bit of a drop-off and you can walk over to the other side and there's a few angles to be found there Natural Bridges definitely makes a great sunset photo shoot area and it can be a great astro area just depending on the weather. Uh, the angles are kind of tricky when I was there for my second astro photography night I visited and the Milky Way wasn't in the right position at the beginning of the night. I kind of got a shot with the uh, one of the islands there somewhat obscuring the Milky Way. Not really the best composition in my mind but I just kind of had got what I had there. It would have moved into a better position later because I wanted to shoot the viewpoint of the bridge itself with the Milky Way there in the back.
but uh, by that point the, the clouds had come and obscured the Milky Way, so it didn't really work out for me, but definitely has potential for a good uh, Milky Way shot. Another one of my favorite locations in the Cena Corridor was Secret Beach. Secret Beach is actually not marked, but you'll see a small pullout kind of parking lot over there by the road. It's about a third of a mile south of milepost 345. But uh, once you get to the parking lot, the trail is fairly, fairly obvious, very short hike, a lot shorter than to get to natural bridges. Then you get to the opening and you'll see all these little rock islands in the distance and the open area and you can hike down to the shore and get some shots down there. It makes great, uh, makes for a great sunset, possibly sunrise as, as I had mentioned with the clouds in the right place. Any of these western coast lines could work for sunrise but primarily great sunset location can get busy because uh even though it's unmarked it's a popular location but uh makes for a great sunset location also a good astrophotography location when i went there for astrophotography there was already a, a bunch of photographers so you know plan your night not everybody stays there the whole time uh, i stay there actually till sunrise so i could shoot some blue hour foreground plates but uh you know, there, there's enough space for everybody. You can get some, some cool shots from up there on the top. You can get the selfie, classic selfie standing on the little outcropping there. You can make your way down to the beach. There's just so many angles to shoot there. And uh, the Milky Way is just in perfect position all night. Um, great, great for astrophotography, great for sunsets, and definitely a must-visit location. Another location further down the coast is uh, Whales Head Beach. I saw some cool shots here for sunset and astro, but when I visited... And I used the PhotoPills app. The, sun, the Milky Way was not going to be in the right location. And um, just due to logistics, I didn't stay there for sunset either. But there's some uh, rock sea stacks, rock formations, different things to work with. Sort of a Ruby Beach kind of vibe. While you're in this uh, southernmost area of Oregon, you might as well cross the border and visit into uh, California to see some of the amazing redwood forests that they have there. The nearest one is called Jedediah Smith state park 20 minutes from the border there's a few different trails you know a lot of the the redwoods are kind of the same in my mind it just really comes down to how dense the forest is whether it's going to be photogenic or not uh, if you want to get those light rays kind of go during a foggy sort of atmospheric morning but uh, there's plenty of trails and plenty of different angles to get there i got mostly video shots for my travel video when i was there but um you know, one of the pieces of advice they give out is when you're shooting forests in general, to wear some sort of a red jacket or red rain jacket to have that red and green contrast and, you know, take selfie photos with yourself as the, the focal point. Just a little technique that some people do and it's quite popular on Instagram. While Oregon is known for its amazing coastlines and forests, it also has a lot of inland locations, a little bit less visited, but uh, desert kind of places. Uh, there's the Alford uh, Desert. There's the Oregon Dunes. But one of the locations I did make the trip out to was the Painted Hills at the John Day Fossil Beds National Monument. This is really far inland, about four hours from Portland. I'm not really sure if it's really worth the drive. I just wanted to get some kind of a landscape that wasn't the forest or the coast, just to have a little bit of variety in my photos. But basically it's these interesting looking hills, not exactly multicolor like some photos I've seen. I'm not really sure. It's some location in California. These are more, uh, orange, yellow tones, just interesting mounds. You're not allowed to walk on them. There's a trail that goes alongside and getting shots might be a little bit tricky because there isn't, you know, your classic leading lines and your focal point at the end, but just an interesting place to visit. Uh, good for time lapses. You know, one of the best sunsets I got was ironically at this location, just the amazing clouds and the colors and all that really n nothing that I got in any other locations I could have used in some of the other locations that I visited. But as it just so happened, uh, there was better sunset there. So that kind of worked to my advantage as far as the photo that I took for, like I said, a four hour drive from Portland. So it is a long drive, but if you happen to be in the area, it's, it's a pretty cool spot to visit. Another inland location we visited when we were actually in the town of Salem was the Silver Falls State Park. It's about 30 minutes from from Salem and it's a 20 mile trail about 15 waterfalls it loops around it's a bit of a hike we only really visited the first about three three or four waterfalls and then just turn around just due to time that was the day before we made the drive down to the uh, scenic corridor so it was a quick visit got some cool like long expo long expo time lapse kind of things wasn't the best weather but definitely a, a cool spot to visit for waterfall photography and, and your long expo stuff Quite busy, you know, there's a huge parking lot, completely filled up. Even during these COVID times, there's a lot of people out and about hiking. But, you know, just what it is, 
it's, uh, it's probably safer when you're outdoors anyways. Cool, cool little spot to visit though if you're um, sort of in the Salem, Salem area and, and pretty accessible. Another location I visited just due to logistics reasons and I was quite surprised when I saw it was Tumalo Falls. Tumalo Falls is about 30 minutes from Bend, not to be confused with Tumalo State Park, which I didn't visit, but it's something not completely different, but it's not exactly in the same place. Tumalo Falls was a surprisingly large waterfall. The, there's a parking lot right there, and the, the trail from the parking lot will take you right to a point where you can see in the distance the, uh, the large waterfall, or you can actually make a hike and get a view from the top. Though for photos, I don't really like any top-down shots unless it's something taken with a drone or something like that. So close to the trail where the viewing platform is, if you go around, you can actually walk along the river. Uh, it's not an official trail, but it is well hiked from what, it, from what I saw. And you can make your way pretty much up to the base of the waterfall. Though when you get to the base, you're a little bit too close because um, it's partially probably due to the wind when I visited, but there is a lot of water vapor there. So I try to take a photo from right at the bottom, way too close, work my way back, and I was still able to use the, the river as a leading line and the waterfall there in a the distance. So it worked out well for the composition. Wasn't the most interesting weather. It was sort of midday cloudy, but uh, through some editing, dodging and burning, I was able to pull out a decent photo from it. Also bonus is that drones are allowed there. So I got some cool drone video shots, revealing drone shots, but a really accessible and surprisingly large waterfall. Lastly, a interesting location to visit. I wouldn't really call it a landscape location, but an interesting location to visit as you're leaving Portland, about half an hour out of Portland, is what's called Airplane Home. It's actually a guy who bought a 737 and converted it into a house. You might have seen these, these uh, classic shots, top-down drone shots of, uh, of an airplane in the middle of a forest, which is kind of deceiving because it's actually a place this guy lives, and the forest portion is, is really just immediately around the plane itself. The rest of it is uh, it's a lot of farmlands and, and houses. It's not exactly the suburbs, but it's a widespread out farmland kind of area. And there's just with this little corner of forest with the airplane in the middle. And I mean, you, you could actually visit the uh, airplane itself. I believe the guy offers tours, but he actually lives there. So something you have to arrange in advance and probably during non-COVID times. But um, it's a cool place as you're making your way out of Portland, just pop out of the car, put the drone up, get an interesting little top-down shot. Everybody asks, you know, is that a crashed plane? What is it? But uh, it's really just uh, what they call the airplane home. So that's a wrap for this guide of the Pacific Northwest. Like I said, I'm barely scratching the surface. There is 40 plus locations on my original location list and who knows how many that I didn't even find out through my research or that's something that's only locals known, but between Washington and Oregon, between the coastlines and the forests and the deserts, there's just so much to see, so much to photograph. You gotta spend months there just caravanning and sleeping in your car and visiting all these locations especially if you want to get each location in its, in its best light and best conditions and it's just a place that you can just see and shoot some amazing locations so if you have any questions or comments leave them in the comment section below be sure to check out my other videos for photo tutorials of the location guides and just general travel content that i put out be sure to like and subscribe for more and i will see you on the next one